kids, uh, most, most of you listening to me, uh, your kids are sort of at the lower end of this, right? Some of you have a few, uh, you know, like I do at that sort of, uh, you know, sort of the 10 to 12 range. Uh, but most of your kids are probably in the 5 to 8, uh, maybe 5 to 10 range. So they're right right there at the, at the beginning of this period or in the middle of this period. And this is a time when the child is, is uh, developing and, and is developing uh, uh, more independence, independence of choice, independence of personality. So first five years, six years, you know, they're very dependent on you, right? They pretty much, whatever you say is like, um, I'll use the term the gospel, right? Not, not gospel like as we use it, but it's the truth, right? They, 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 they sort of uh, uh, believe everything you say, like whatever you tell them, they believe it, right? If you, if you have little kids below that age of five or six, you, you can see where whatever you're like the, uh, you know, like the, uh, the God figure in their life, right? Whatever dad says or whatever mom says must be right. That's who they go to. Uh, now, as they start going to school, they start getting exposed to, uh, or as they start growing into these years, uh, five plus, six plus, they start getting exposed to other people, right? Whether it's school teachers, whether it's uh, uh, friends at school, whether it's, you know, people who, who have different backgrounds and uh, they start uh, getting exposed to more media, let's say, um, you know, and uh, uh, more, and they're, they're spending more time away from, from the parents, right? The first four or five years, they're pretty much with the parents the whole time. Parents provide everything. You have the maximum influence over them. Um, and uh, now they're starting to sort of move away. Okay, so that's sort of, uh, it's important to understand what's going on uh, in the mind of the child during each of these stages. And, uh, you know, and just to recap again, you know, what have you taught them hopefully during uh, infancy to childhood? This is where you lay the foundation. Okay, you've taught him or her to see himself as a creature made by God and made for God. Go back to that vision, right? The chief end of man is to glorify God. The vision that we have for our children, that they would glorify God and enjoy him forever. And that starts with understanding who God is and understanding that you are made by God. And because you are made by God, God is the manufacturer. Therefore, you need to live for God and you need to please God, right? And God's word is the is the Bible, right? Uh, and then you... You teach them that, uh, you know, hopefully they, they, at this point, they've understood what it means to be under authority, right? Now they're moving from the, uh, not just the exclusive authority of the parent to maybe authority in the school with the teachers, uh, you know, maybe authority of a Sunday school teacher in Sunday school. Um, and uh, hopefully they've learned to obey, right? They've learned the importance of obedience. Of course, they won't be perfect, uh, but... Um, but they've learned what obedience means. They've learned the consequences of disobedience. They've learned about how disobedience is a result of sin, right? And uh, now you come into this phase of childhood and, and the main objective here is to develop their character, okay? And, and, uh, and this is really where character development comes to the fore. You're going beyond just obedience, beyond just developing obedience to actually... Uh, you know, working on their character in, in several areas. And, and we'll look at that. So uh, some of the areas where you want to develop characters in these kind of areas, like being dependable, okay, being honest, being kind, being considerate, being helpful, okay, you can see some of the character of the fruit of the spirit coming out here, right? Being diligent, being loyal, uh, character of humility, uh, controlling yourself, right? Moral purity, you start teaching them about morality and right and wrong in terms of, you know, all of these kind of things. And as they start getting exposed to these various things, uh, you know, you find uh, that it's important to teach them these things. Okay. So, uh, so what you're trying to do is go beyond just obedience, uh, as I said, and you want to start building biblical wisdom. Okay. So you go back to the Proverbs and it talks about wisdom, right? And wisdom is something they need to make the right decisions. So up until this point, they've been with you the entire time. Uh, you tell them, you know, do this or don't do that, right? They're following your orders and your, um, you know, uh, instruction. Now they're starting to move away from you. They're getting exposed to other environments. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes without supervision, maybe among uh, peers in the, in the schools and all that. And they're going to learn a lot of things. And you want them to be in a position to make right decisions and, uh, and avoid wrong decisions, uh, even when you're not there. So you're not going to always be there 
for them, right? Uh, and you want them to start developing the ability to be able to make those decisions on their own, right? And uh, one of the one of the ways that a lot of parents deal with this is you make rules. Okay, now there is certainly a place for rules, but but we try to solve the problem by making rules. You do this or don't do that, or if this is, you know, and, and certainly rules are important in providing sort of a guardrail, but the problem is that you can't really, um, you know, you can't really make rules for everything, okay? You cannot anticipate every situation, and that's, you know, that's even even today, but but for example, you know, most of us grow up with some rules, right? Uh, when we were growing up, so rules also tend to, not uh, have much relevance beyond generations, right? So the rules that applied to us uh, when we were growing up, when all of you were growing up, many of them are no longer relevant or, uh, you know, they've sort of become outdated simply because the world has changed, okay? Technology has changed. They now have access to things, you know, so take, for example, uh, you know, things like uh, pornography, right? So pornography, you know, when I was growing up, it, it was, uh, you know, it was uh, on paper, right? It was magazines and and uh, literature, things like that, right? That uh, that was the only way you got access to it. Today, it's no longer that. It's it's right there in the in the palm of their hands. And many of our children, by the time they are five and six, they are already masters of using uh, smartphones, and and they can, uh, you know, they're digital natives, as they call them, right? They're far more advanced than we ever were. Uh, at their age, I mean, they, they've got technology in their hands at their fingertips that we never had. And, and so, you know, you can't, I mean, you've got to keep coming up with new rules if you if you follow rule base. Again, this is not to say that there's not a place for rules, but you just can't rely on rules because, you know, every time you make a rule and then the problem with rules is like, you know, when Paul talks about in Romans, right? He says, he says the law, uh, the purpose of the law, the law couldn't change anybody, but what did the law do? The law made sin evident. Okay, by creating the rules, it it sort of uh, drew a line, and you you know so that you can know, uh, and you became more aware, right, of what is wrong and what is not. And then, being sinners, we always tempted to, uh, you know, to get up to the the line there and, and and avoid just sort of, you know, popping over the line, right? And we're always trying to test the limits. We all did that with our parents when they made rules, right? Um, you know, and uh, certainly our children will do the same. Uh, and uh, so rules have a place, but they certainly are not going to solve the problem. So what you need to do is, um, you know, and, and then of course, going back to our, our objective here, which is to change their hearts, right? Keeping rules doesn't come from hearts. It, it leads to Phariseeism. So, you know, when you study uh, all the gospels, we see how, you know, the, the Pharisees came to Jesus with all of these kind of things, you know, and they had created a whole system. They had like books, you know, uh, of uh, of rules that said, okay, yeah, here's the law of Moses, right? And they sort of missed the point that the purpose of the law of Moses was to bring about, you know, a change in their attitudes, uh, a change in their heart uh, to do the right thing and meet the intent that God has. It was there to show uh, the heart of God and the mind of God right? And what God desired to see in people, but they had sort of reduced it down to a rule book that said, okay, on the Sabbath, you can do this, but you can't do that, right? This is okay. And that is not okay. And, you know, um, and that's why they, they used to, and Jesus so totally messed them up because, uh, or, you know, he would come and he would go and heal somebody on the Sabbath. And, and so they would come with questions, is it lawful to heal a man on the Sabbath? Or if, uh, you know, and, and then Jesus had to keep answering them, right? Or, or they had laws about, um, about, uh, uh, you know, adultery, right? Uh, so they had reduced the law of adultery to physical, right? Physical adultery with a woman, a man with a woman uh, or a man. And Jesus said, no, that's not it. Okay, I tell you that if you look on a woman uh, lustfully, that you have already sinned, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart, right? So he says, there's a bigger principle here uh, that you need to understand that what God is absolutely holy and he's looking for more purity, Right, and that's what we need to strive for, not to keep some law and say, oh, well, you know, it's okay that I'm lusting after that woman as long as I don't go and, you know, physically uh, commit adultery with her, right? Uh, so similarly with our children, you know, of course, adultery is hopefully not an issue, you gotta deal with them, but, uh, but nevertheless, you know, you want to develop their heart so that they have a change in their hearts and they do things with the right reasons and their heart is trained 
to uh, you know to do things in a way that pleases God as opposed to just keeping laws because uh, or rules because what happens when you when you uh, and I've seen this in some of my ch children where some of them are really good okay they're very good about following all the the rules but then that leads to um, very much of a Pharisaical attitude right so so they're always like uh, very self-righteous okay it leads to self-righteousness uh, and, and selfishness and they always uh, you know so the the one who who is very good at keeping all the rules who's number you know the most obedient you know these are the kids that uh, when you go for your pta meeting you know you'll get uh, a report saying that oh they're so well behaved and they're so good and and they're the leader in the class and they don't make any trouble you know, but then very often you'll find when you look carefully and the way they deal with their siblings, younger siblings or others is they always want to point out what they're doing wrong, right? Uh, and they consider themselves to be better than the other. So when you have this kind of a rule-based, uh, you know, upbringing, then you become a Pharisee, okay? Uh, and we don't want to grow Pharisees. We want uh, to focus on building character from the inside. And this is what happens during this childhood period from five and six to roughly 12, 13, okay? Uh, so, uh, so that's important. So, um, you know, and, and I would encourage you to really read uh, the book, uh, okay? There's, a, it talks about all of these things in, in detail, uh, you know, and, uh, um, and then it also gives us this, this, uh, this, this tool, okay? That says, and it says that you've got to, uh, you've got to evaluate your child, you as a parents, husband and wife, you know, it's very important. And many of you are, you, those of you who work, uh, you know, in the, you know, out there, you, you, you get evaluated, right? And I know, I know in our company, you know, you're supposed to do a mid-year evaluation and then a end of year evaluation and give feedback to your employees on how they're doing, right? Now, very often, um, you know, we don't, this is not, we, we, we take it seriously in the workplace, but we don't at home. And this is exactly what you need to do. Okay, you need to sit down and talk to yourself and say, how is, how is my child doing, right? What are the challenges we have? What are the good things about him or her? What are the things that they need to work on in terms of their character training? Okay, so, so this is a tool that helps you to understand uh, what are the needs of your child? Help you to organize things that make up their personalities, and and to to look at what are their strengths and what are their weaknesses, uh, and that is a, it's 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 very nicely and simply defined in the book. And you look at the child from three perspectives. Okay, the child in relationship to God. Okay, how is your child in relationship to himself, and how is the child in relationship to others? So it's God, himself, and others. Okay, upward inward and outward. And, and you need to ask yourself some of these questions, right? So the first prong is looking at what is a, what kind of a relationship does this child have with God? You know, how does a child view God? Hopefully if you brought them up uh, in their infancy to childhood period by telling them about God, telling them about sin, and this is that Deuteronomy 6 thing about, you know, talk, talk about, uh, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. And you shall talk about it. You shall practice it and you shall talk about it with your child, right? When you're sitting in the house, when you're, when you're, when you rise up, when you lie down and when you walk by the wayside, right? So by the time your child comes to this childhood, they, they should have, they should have a good understanding of who God is. They should have a good understanding of the fact that God created the universe. God created them, that they are, uh, you know, human beings in, in authority under God, that God has ordained you as their parent, and therefore they are an authority uh, under your authority, right? And, uh, and some of the things you want to ask yourself, I'll just go to the book here. Some of the questions is, is your child living, this is on page 166, okay? Is your child living in a conscious need for God? And what is the content of his relationship with God? Is he concerned to know and love God? Is God a source of strength, comfort, and help? Okay, take that one. Is God a source of strength, comfort, and help? When your child is is um, is uh, young, okay, and your child is not, uh, say, having a problem obeying, okay, in, in that uh, infancy to childhood period, you know, uh, use this approach of making them pray. Okay, you pray with them, you make them pray. And that's why, uh, you know, when we talked about uh, applying the rod, okay, you apply the rod and then you sit them down and you pray with them, right? So you're teaching them this idea of God is somebody important in my life, in your life, in their life, right? And, uh, 
uh, and that we go to God. So when you have problems, you know, I mean, you know, we, uh, you know, I spend some time when, whenever Josiah has certain problems, you know, I encourage him to pray. Okay. And even when our cat disappeared, okay, we prayed about it. And then the cat showed up a few days later. You know, maybe the cat wouldn't have showed up, but, you know, but it's still an opportunity to, to pray even about simple things. So they need to understand that God cares about these things, that God is somebody important and he's somebody real uh, who we talk to, right? Is he moved by God's ways and truth? You know, does he understand, does he or she, uh, you know, understand that uh, we need to do certain things and we need to not do other things because that's the will of God, right? That's the will of God as revealed in scripture. Okay, is he alive to spiritual realities? Is there any evidence that he's carrying on an independent from you as a parent relationship with God? Okay, does a child... Um, say, start reading the Bible. Does he have an interest in Bible stories? Okay, depending on age. Um, you know, when he's seven and eight, okay, uh, does he have that habit of of um, of regularly reading? Uh, you know, starting to have that quiet time, right? Um, and and these are this things that you used to evaluate. Okay, what is the relation? My child's relationship to God, right? How healthy is it? What are the things that he's doing or not doing? Um, you know, and. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, are there other gods in their life, right? Are there false gods before which your child bows? What are the things uh, without which he cannot be happy? Like, are they too attracted to, uh, say, media? Are they too attracted to, uh, you know, games? Are they too attracted to other things, friendships, right? As opposed to God. So, again, it's not that, you know, your child is going to be perfect, but it's, it's only if you sit down and ask yourself these questions, okay, uh, during this time frame, the stage of childhood, you know, that you know, where does he need work? Where does he not, right? Nobody is perfect. And there's always going to be a lot of work required. But, you know, the, the point of this is that be deliberate about it. Okay. Uh, it's not going to happen automatically. If you just think that our oh, children are going to grow, okay, they're just going to happen. Remember that shaping influences we talked about, right? Why is it important to have regular family prayers uh, with the child there? Okay, it's, uh, you know, it's to, to, to shape their, you know, build that shaping influence where they realize that we go to God, that we read the word of God, that we pray to God as a family, right? And when you do that, their relationship with God will be built, right? Uh, uh, is his God small or grand? You know, do you go to God for every, do you teach him to go? Does he understand that we can go to God for every little problem? You know, they're having a problem in school. You know, take it to the Lord. They're having a problem with another child. Take it to the Lord. Um, is um, Does he think of God as a friend, a judge, a helper, or a taskmaster? Is he living out the fullness of seeing himself in Christ, or is he trying to worship and serve himself? You know, does he have selfishness in him, right? So you look at all of these character qualities that, that you're seeing in the child, and that's why, you know, uh, you observe his behavior. You're not trying to fix just the behavior. You're using that behavior to work backwards to understand what's the attitude of the heart, right? And in this case, in relationship to God. So that's the, that's the first prong. The second prong is the child in relationship to himself. How does your child think about himself or herself? Okay, how well does he understand himself? How aware is he or she of his strengths and weaknesses? Does he understand his personality? Is he self-conscious about the... Uh, about his personality, right? So, so every child is different, right? And it's important that that we that, that during this time we evaluate, you know, how how well does a child understand himself or, or herself? And and in the book that there are some examples of a, of a few kids, and you can you can read that, right? So, what attitudes toward himself does he evidence? Is a child comfortable with himself? Does he have uh, you know, a healthy sense of self-esteem without going into selfishness or or does he have pride, right? He thinks he's much better. Uh, that's a pharisaical attitude I talked about, right? Much better than everybody else. Does he have arrogance, right? Is he arrogant? Um, is he fearful? Is he afraid of things all the time, right? Uh, um, you know, is he is he helpful to others? Okay, does he have a false dependence on us? Does he feel that uh, better than others, or does he feel inadequate around others? Okay, is he always comparing himself to others? And and remember, these are all things that that your own attitude towards your child can feed. Now, one of the one of the tendencies we have, especially uh, among Indian parents, is that we tend to compare our children a lot, right? Especially given the competitive, uh, you know, competitiveness of our society. You know, I remember listening to a parent once. Uh, who was talking about talking to another parent and 
was boasting that you know their two year old or three year old could count from one to hundred okay uh, and can your child count to one from one to hundred okay so there's this kind of tendency to to feed this sort of competitiveness and things like that which creates problems because if your child is not able to do it that creates um, you know problems uh, in terms of his relationship to himself right they start um, thinking that they're not quite measuring up right they're not quite good enough right uh, so so again the point here is 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 that you know every child is different every child is going to have different issues and you as a parent need to sit down and uh, do this evaluation right how is this child in relationship to himself and then the third point is um, is the child in relationship to others so how are they in their social relationship how are they in dealing with others maybe with their siblings maybe with other children at school um, what sort of relationship do they have with them okay what does he bring out in others you know i can i can see with uh, with my younger kids when they're in school just the way they come and talk about other other kids okay some of them they talk very negatively about them that's that's giving you evidence of how they view others and that's an opportunity to build that sort of you know understand that hey there's a character problem here that they are uh, you know they are thinking too much of themselves and putting down others right uh, and they're not having that sort of heart of love towards others so so you look at how they relate to others you know is he pleasant with other children and again there's some good questions here i encourage you to read these on pages uh, 1 uh, you know 166 through 168 69 i'm just going to read those on uh, is he Uh, is he pleasant with other children his age how does he deal with disappointment in people how does he respond to being sinned against right so the children will say nasty things will bully um, what are the areas of relational strength what are the areas of relational weakness okay so so again uh, once you do this you know you 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 take a checkpoint maybe you can write down you know what are the positives what are the negatives in terms of these three areas you know my child in relation to god relationship to himself and relationship to others okay and do this you know at least twice a year okay periodically both you both of both husband and wife uh, you know it's a very good practice to do because that allows you to be deliberate about it and and prayerfully work on on specific areas where your child might be uh, you know having a challenge okay so um so that's the uh, those are the objectives so let's talk about what are the what are the procedures that you follow okay and that's uh, chapter 17 in the book so uh, you know you've got to address the heart okay keep that in mind so you want to focus on providing the right motivation okay explore the why so when your child shows certain attitudes you got to first look at the the behavior look at the attitude so for example a child who's they give an example of a child who's grumbling and complaining right now grumbling and complaining typically is a is a symptom of uh, you know of discontentment okay or or maybe unhappiness with the world or unhappiness with god or or, or wanting something that you're not getting okay now if you just uh, if you just focus on changing that behavior and say you know you stop grumbling okay uh, now maybe the child will stop grumbling but that 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 root character issue is not dealt with right so so it's important that you do that and and we need to tell them um you know what have they done wrong or what have they not done that they should be doing what are the the uh, something right that they failed to do right and uh, and in this phase you need to appeal to the conscience and you need to start seeing more and more of communication because very often you know the child may be uh, doing a lot of things which remember the spanking uh, is limited to uh, disobedience or rebellion okay it's rebelling against what you have told them to do so a lot of things uh, and he explains this in the book here a lot of things that they do in this uh, in this period Uh, some of it will be rebellion some of it will be disobedience of course but uh, a lot of it is not really so much disobedience but it's uh, it's really uh, it's and it's not about you right it's about the way they're dealing with their siblings or dealing with others right and and those are not things that you should spank them for unless you know after you've talked to them and explained to them they uh, you know they keep on doing those things then of course maybe uh, there's a there's a, a, a need that to use the rod okay um um so so it's important that you you focus more on the communication as you get into these childhood uh, years right the the 6 and above you know you will uh, you will see that um, uh, you should see that you're starting to use that communication tool 
much more than the uh, rod okay uh, and uh, and you need to focus on bringing about that heart change okay so and heart change begins with the conviction of sin which comes through the appeal to conscience so in that section in the book he talks about how the lord jesus you know how he used these parables right whether it was the lawyer you know the the lawyer who came and said teacher what must i do to inherit eternal life and and jesus asked him a question you know so this is a great way to do it okay this is uh, you know like the socratic method you know which is uh, when when you know you you ask the child questions so that they start thinking right and jesus uh, you know tell him uh, ask him a question he says uh, you know what does the law say right and he said he and this man understood the law he had been following it all his life and he he summarizes the law into the two great commandments to love god and your neighbor okay and jesus said okay you go and do likewise okay you do that right do what you said um you know and um, um you know and and you will inherit eternal life and then he asked the question well who is my neighbor okay so 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 christ you know answers that by giving him the uh, parable of the uh, of the uh, the good samaritan right uh, and again this is where the man uh, really gets convicted okay because he knows that that uh, the way he looks at things you know he wouldn't have helped that uh, you know that uh, that that man right uh, like the samaritan would he would have been one of those people that that walked by them okay so uh, so jesus does it actually very often you will find that jesus does it give them the answer but he makes them think right and he does it by asking questions so this is a great technique to to keep probing okay you keep probing from the action you know why did you do that but what were you thinking when you did that we talked about this earlier you know the asking those probing uh, you know questions that are seeking to get the child down to the heart issue okay uh, and uh, you know similarly when when peter asks about forgiveness you know the lord um, the lord gives him that answer you know it's it's about your attitude right you have to forgive him 70 times 7 basically without limit okay there's no limit for jesus uh, peter says peter's looking for a rule right peter says uh, you know uh, lord how many times shall i forgive my brother when he sins against me okay is it seven times you know and he says i say to you not seven times but 70 times seven okay jesus and he wasn't about 77 times he wasn't really saying that he's saying you know what you should forgive them as you know as many times as he sins against you you should have that that heart attitude to forgive him no matter what without any limit right limitless forgiveness just as just as god has forgiven us right and uh, and there he uses the parable about the man who's been forgiven more right and he used that with simon the pharisee as well so we see here that um, you know appealing to their conscience because remember they have a conscience which convicts them of sin right we see that in in romans chapter 2 uh, you know where the conscience that god has put in there it convicts them it 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 tells them about sin it, it gives them that sense of what is right and wrong and you are appealing to that in terms of building up their character so uh, you know and uh, as you do this you'll find that you know that that their character is built up and then you know when we look at what does it mean to build character it means to live consistently with who god is and who i am okay so so character means uh, really reflecting the nature of god okay in 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 various areas of our life and he gives us that example here about uh, you know about uh, dependability okay so what is the definition of dependability all right dependable or, or why should we be dependable okay it's not because being dependable you know sometimes we'll say well you have to be dependable because if you're dependable then maybe you'll uh, you know people will uh, give you more responsibility and you will do well in the workplace and you will get all of these things happen to you no okay you don't you don't be dependable uh, in order to achieve something you don't be dependable so that you'll get rewarded for it but you be dependable because god is a dependable god he is a faithful god right and if you look on on page 176 he says you know who god is right think of these two things okay live consistently with who god is and who i am so you need to contrast yourself with god and, and then mold your and your character needs to be molded to reflect more and more 
who God is, right? So who God is, he made me, he placed me here at this time. He is ultimate. I must stand before him one day. I must give account before him. He has promised to draw near to those who are humble and contrite in heart. He will help me to know his strength and aid. I can know him and the ability to obey him. He has promised a blessing to those who are dependable. Okay, that's who God is, right? He has called us to be dependable and he blesses those who are dependable. We bring glory to him when we are dependable, okay? So you do it for the glory of God. Remember how this now ties into that vision, right? The chief end of man, the chief end of a child should be to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So who am I, right? You, all, or you not only look at who God is, but who are you? Who am I? Okay, I am a creature. I've been made by God for God. He has placed me here at this time and given me these opportunities. I must bring honor to him. I am made to bring him glory. As I draw near to him and seek his face, he will enable me to obey him. I can come to know his help and strength. God promises to give grace to all who call upon him, right? So God is there to help me. God wants me uh, to be dependable, right? And then he goes on again to talk about the example of moral purity, right? Why do we have to be morally pure? So sometimes there's a tendency for us to say, you know, and this is all true. Okay, and somewhere this, obviously you explain consequences, but the reason to be morally pure is not just uh, because, you know, it keeps you away from trouble or it keeps you away from, I don't know, some diseases or whatever, right? But it is because of the holiness of God. It is because uh, of a clear understanding of who God is, right? And it's important at this, uh, during this stage of life, that during this childhood stage, that we are teaching them these things about the nature of God. You know, God is holy, right? Uh, you know, he has promised protection and blessing to those who honor him, okay, in their relationship. He has warned of slavery and ruin, which comes upon all those who fail to honor his desires. Okay, so, so God is holy. He has created boundaries for the relationships and he blesses us when we observe those boundaries and obeying him, uh, you know, obeying him in this area of, uh, of purity um, you know, uh, brings blessing. And if you disobey him, then yes, it leads to shame and degradation and there are, there are negative consequences to it. So, so it's important that we are always bringing them back to that understanding of God. And you can see what's happening here, that if you do this with this child at this age, you know, they, they're, they're starting to build a healthy image of who God is, right? Uh, you've already taught them about sin. You've taught them about how God's provision for sin. You're teaching them more about God. And as they see problems in their character, you're showing them the character of God and, 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 and trying to mold their hearts, you know, shepherd their hearts towards building those character qualities, uh, you know, having those character qualities be developed in their life, you know, and they begin to see their inadequacy. And that's where you bring in the gospel. Okay. So parents must strive for this long-term character development. Okay. And, uh, um, you know, and as you do that, uh, you know, you uh, you will start seeing this kind of change in their life. Okay, so so focus on interpreting their behavior in terms of character. What what does this behavior tell me about the child? Right? Uh, does it tell me that they are selfish? Does it tell me that they have too much pride? Does it tell me that um, you know that uh, uh, that um, uh, they don't have an attitude of love? Right? They they are more selfish and they love themselves rather than loving their, their fellow man. Go back to those three things, you know, in that uh, evaluation criteria, right? Relationship to God, relationship to self, and relationship to others, okay? Um, so so as you do this, you know, it's important that you keep at it because what we're talking about here is a long-term vision, right? Um, you know, and, uh, um, you know, and you're trying to build these kind of things. I mean, you know, one of the, a very simple example that I, I do now with, with Josiah is I've taught him, you know, to uh, simple thing here to make his bed, okay? Because he and I sleep in the same bed, and you know, I get up early, uh, you know, and then he gets up later, and uh, you know, it's a it's a mess. So you know, I've taught him, and and one day I called him, and he wouldn't do this; he would just leave it. Or when I told him to do it, he would just do it very haphazardly, okay? And um, and in fact, I showed him a little video of a of a graduation talk which I had seen somewhere on Facebook of this um, this. Uh, uh, a guy from the Navy talking about the importance of making your bed, okay, and how if you make your bed, you know, it, it, um, you know, how, how that helps you to, you know, it's like uh, the way he explained is that when you do that, it means that you've accomplished your first task, you know, and it builds character in you, you know, it builds 
dependability it builds responsibility okay simple thing so now this guy gets up and before without me even telling him he makes his bed and i can if i turn around the camera i can show you <coughs> how nicely he makes the bed once in a while he doesn't have to call him back and and he and he fixes it but but in doing that you know i i didn't just tell him you make your bed because uh you know i say so right or because um you know you're the last guy to get up and you have to do it but but we linked it to that character of of responsibility and the character quality of dependability right and uh, and order like god is a god of order okay and and neatness and you need to keep this neat so so anyway that's just a simple example so so focus on this uh, long term character development you know have this long term vision okay um that uh, that you look at the way your child behaves you know how are they okay now i have some children who will do things because i tell them to do it but their heart is not in it okay they they're fundamentally lazy okay they have been lazy and um, you know that's an opportunity to sit down and talk to them about uh, about how uh, you know uh, not being lazy honors the lord you know how the lord teaches them through some of these yeah, it's not the most fond thing it may not be the thing they enjoy the most okay but that's teaching about life right you can't have you can't just go through life uh, you know expect to only do the things that you like doing right we all have a, a responsibility god has given us uh, the responsibility to get certain things done right and then you take them back to the proverbs right so go back to scripture you know talk about the lazy man why is it you know what what is the wisdom uh, let's just say about laziness right laziness clothes a man with rags right go to the ant you sluggard consider her ways and be wise okay you got to you know if you're lazy it says the lazy or the sloth right in, in proverbs it talks about the lazy man or the slothful man he's a sloth okay and it just condemns that so so take them back to say this is what god thinks about laziness okay because god wants us to glorify him we don't glorify him by being lazy because we are not using the abilities that he's given us we are not honing the the abilities that he's given us you know in a way that allows us to to glorify himself because if you if you grow up with this character of laziness okay then it has bigger consequences later in life right um so anyway so that's uh, that's pretty much what i wanted to cover today um uh, you know important period of life uh, I, i think uh, you know next time we'll talk about uh, we'll actually close out i guess with the last lesson which is uh, the lesson on uh, teenagers and um, and i got to tell you that if you if you do well in these last two stages you know the teenage years will actually be a very joyful time okay uh, and i've had experience of both ways you know where you know some of it, some of them have been, been joyful some of them it's been a big problem right because uh, this this thing in this period you know they start sort of you know becoming more independent but they still somewhat dependent on you like once they become teenagers you know they are like totally on another wavelength right but if you've done the right things here and you've 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 built their you you've managed to you know develop their character again they're not never going to be perfect but but if you've built some of these character qualities you'll find that those teenagers can actually be a, a blessing so uh, so yeah with that i'm going to all right so so go ahead anybody have any uh, questions uh, many of you have kids at the sage what are some of the challenges that you face now have you seen this kind of thing do you actually spend time evaluating their character and and making that you know and a good way to do this is look at the fruit of the spirit okay uh you know gentleness kindness uh and by the way maybe there is one more point i should mention uh, i'm trying to find it here in the book um about uh, where is it it's about you know sometimes we think that um, that the children um you know like uh, that that we should let them be saved before we focus on these things i don't know if anybody remembers reading that if you read it ah here we go okay many people uh, yeah many people conclude that if their child is not a believer they cannot urge him to his duty in the light of who god is okay so this is talking about training character this is on page end of page 176 and going on to page 177 if you don't call him to be what god has called him to be you end up giving him a standard of performance that is within the realm of his native abilities apart from grace it is a standard that does not require knowing and trusting god in other words you either call your children to be what they cannot be apart from grace or you reduce the standard giving them um giving them one they can keep if you do that you reduce the need for god accordingly so the point is that you know you don't have to wait for them to be a believer 
okay to start teaching them these things about the 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 fruit of the spirit so that you know they build their understanding and certainly as they grow up and they struggle with it that's an opportunity to then really talk about you know what yeah you we struggle we all struggle i struggle you struggle right with this because you need the holy spirit within you and you need uh, the lord with you and that's when again you can go back to that gospel right and this is a way to get them really get their mind more and more ready to to trust in the lord and to get to that point of salvation right the very process of disciplining and teaching them these character qualities brings them further along that that path towards that point where they will actually uh, you know um, they will actually uh, come to that salvation experience okay any questions uh, george jan can you hear me yeah yeah one of the things that i have been doing the last uh, maybe few months with both the boys is we are having a, a, a you know a review mechanism where we have the boys also have a diary and a planner so we are uh, mm. making them plan their days on the different aspects spiritual and their daily chores and then at the end huh? of the day we do a review of where or how they have completed those tasks and why they okay. need to it so it's not easy i'm not saying that they are you know in the yeah. from the beginning but over yep. the time you know at least it makes them uh, own own uh, or take accountability uh, for things rather than mm. you know telling them so uh, you know uh, transforming them from a you know do this do that to themselves taking ownership of things and uh, from all the uh, area so this mm. is something that's so great yeah how how old are your boys again one is 6 the other is 10 then yeah so so you know that's that's exactly i mean that's the childhood period right so um so i think that's that's great so you you are uh, you're sort of uh, you know putting it down on paper so that they can sort of see it so it becomes more deliberate right so that's that's why i talk about doing that evaluation and yeah i mean i think i think uh, one of the things is obviously it takes time right it takes time and maybe not everybody will have the time to do all that but but even sitting down with them uh you know and evaluating how they are doing uh in and you don't have to make it a formal thing it can be just a casual 5 minute conversation right uh or at the at the time you see some wrong behavior or a right behavior commending them for that right um the behavior that's coming from the heart so you got to make sure that it's not just behavior they are doing um you know and and keep observing them right the the most joyful thing is when you see them doing things um, you know uh, when you are not watching right where they when you know that they're not doing it just to please you because they think that you know you're you're listening and so it's you know i'm trying to curry favor with dad or mom uh, but but in their maybe conversations with the siblings and this is a great way to observe the character of a child is the way they deal with their uh, with their siblings okay um you know that that's that i think that's that's an environment god provides for you to so you know we get frustrated sometimes when uh, when say our kids fight with each other you know but here's a different way to look at it is to say oh god is giving me an opportunity to see right to 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 see how what's really in their hearts right where where do i need to put in the work to help them um, you know what are the problems they having that that needs to be dealt with okay so thank you jeffrey for sharing that anybody else have any any positive or not so positive experiences they want to share not so much of a experience but um, george it was a i mean a going through this was a um, reminder that you know it's something that we need to do and which uh, we haven't done before and uh, you know it was uh, uh, it is something that um, uh, we can definitely do because it gives a very good uh, it gives pointers to work on like mm-hmm. we know like you know what mm-hmm. uh, where they are lacking and how we can help them because just externally like you said like every time there is a fight i'm like you know you guys only do this all the time uh, you know this is what happens in this house but uh, trying to you know through different uh, ways and especially in relation to others i like the examples in the book about you know how certain um, habits uh, the teacher was able to look into it differently and try and mm-hmm. uh, do so all of those yeah. are really practical ways that even we can uh, you know address Uh, different issues that we see in our children um, in a different way and mm. that's something that we um, you know i hope to at least try uh, both of us would try and uh, do so practically yeah no I, and i think uh, writing it down is a great way where, where otherwise you know it just comes into your mind and goes away right so you you be deliberate about it you you write down what are the things 
positives as well as negatives and even sitting down with the child periodically and say hey you know uh, i noticed that you're doing this or, or, and start probing right getting down to the heart issue and and think of those techniques that jesus used right so so make them see it right well how do you think when you act that way how do you think that person would feel okay um you know and, and get them to put themselves in the shoes of somebody else you know sometimes it's at school right uh, you know some of my kids they they have their favorite friends at school and uh, you know and then they have others who are not so favorite right and you can you can tell uh, who's favorite and who's not when uh, when they talk about them and they they start <laughs> telling these kind of things you know uh, negative things about them and that's an opportunity to to really sit down and talk to them okay thank you dima um is it wrong to okay here's a question uh, private question is it wrong to expect a certain behavior from your child when they are too young to have a change of heart talking with respect to change external behavior versus no real change in the heart is it wrong to expect a certain behavior well i mean uh, you know this it's it's not about right or wrong i think what we are trying to understand here is or or uh, focus on here is that if you are only focused on changing behavior without getting to the heart then like i said you're just producing a fallacy okay so uh, and and i don't know i don't know in this case uh, when you say too young to have a change of heart uh, i don't know that anybody is too young to have a change of heart i mean especially if if the question is limited to this childhood period certainly uh, beyond 5 uh, even even at the age of 2 or 3 you know a child is capable of having a change of heart right uh, and by the way you know um, when when some children can be very stubborn okay and and i would encourage you to just sit down and pray with that child right so you know what uh, uh, you know sometimes they might they might uh, open up to you and say yeah i know it's wrong but i i try very hard i can't uh, you know and i just can't change okay i try very hard not to uh, scream at my brother or hit my brother or whatever right my sister um you know so that's a great option sit down okay fine you know you can do it because you know you need the lord's help right sit down and pray with them pray with them regularly let them hear you pray for that character quality to be developed in their life so then again you're connecting it back to god and they see that that you rely on god and therefore they should rely on god and and make them pray about it as well right so so always i think the importance of prayer right so so go back to those different um, the different uh, methods of communication right that entreaty and all these kind of things right one of them was prayer okay so go back to that chapter in the book and and we got to always keep evaluating you know what are we doing are we using all the different uh, forms of communication in, in dealing with the child and dealing with the problem uh, so i think there's a lot of tools there, a lot of rich tools there that uh, that we can use okay yeah any other questions or observations or comments Yeah, George, and I just forgot to mention something. So when we are making that planner for each child, right, and they are making a list of let's say eleven or twelve tasks to do for that day. Yeah. At the end of the day, we also do an evaluation out of the twelve tasks whether they have done six, seven, eight, or ten. We ask them mm. to do a self evaluation, right? Okay. So there are twelve tasks. Let's say honest evaluation. Okay, how many have we done? Six, seven. Mm. Okay, they say seven. So the question is, why not the remaining five? right and mm-hmm. then of course we get into each task to see what is the depth of the task what is the quality of the task done so uh, over a period of time of course the child uh, jeffrey get ownership jeffrey did you uh, did you by any chance work in hr yeah you, you know that right he's he's created a performance evaluation system for his kids <laughs> Uh, good that's good yeah the task but yeah. the- thank you jeffrey yeah any other thoughts did you all good uh, all good jocha i think this is uh, very valid in terms of all of its uh, stuff in fact this last year when we finished our home schooling one of the things that we added we created this thing called the report card <laughs> the yeah. report card had these marks but you know both deep and i said that we should also look at character and we were able to list down a few things and you are right i think we have observed that sometimes their self esteem goes down and uh, mm. they are in confident of themselves and sometimes those encouragement to find out what they are good at what their talent is encourage them in, in that area and also the areas of development right i think yep. it is really holistic but we did that once a year but i think this is a good suggestion maybe we should do twice a year yeah 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 
Yeah. Yeah, especially at that age because they're growing fast, you know. So yeah. So I think uh, twice here is a good thing, right? Yeah, interesting. Good, yeah, and, so, and so when Jeffrey made that comment, that, that's also the first thought that came. Self-evaluation HR, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah, and again, you know, everybody can come up with different ways to do it. There's no one way to do it, right? The point is, are you accomplishing uh, what you need to accomplish, right? Regardless of the method, okay? But certainly being more formal about it and writing it down will help and it also helps you to discuss with, uh, you know. And by the way, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think this is, uh, maybe I should make a point here about marriage, okay? I, I think this is a great way uh, to strengthen your marriage, okay? Um, for you and your wife, uh, husband and wife to sit down and talk about the kids. Because you know what I've seen uh, as I've observed, and frankly, this happened in my life too. Uh, you know, when uh, you know, you're, you, you, you get married, right? And you're, uh, you're going through that phase where it's just the two of you and you're so interested in each other. And, um, you know, it's only the two of you and you're focused on each other. Then inevitably the kids, you start having kids, one kid, two kids, you know, and uh, then very soon, what happens is that uh, the kids, the focus becomes the kids, right? Uh, the mother is very focused on taking care of the kids and then the kids go to school and and the focus is on their homework and their exams and this, that. And I mean, I can't tell every any parent. I mean, normally, you know, when you talk to parents about doing something, oh, I can't do anything for the next two weeks because, you know, they've got their... Uh, you know, kindergarten exams. I mean, it starts at kindergarten. Okay, I mean, we had cases where uh, where say, oh, we can't come to camp because we've got uh, our kids have got exams. So what what class are your kids in? They're in, uh, you know, they're in first grade, second grade. I'm like, you're worried about second grade exams? Come on, you know that you can't come to church, can't come to camp, can't come to whatever. Uh, you know the the. But anyway, that's 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 a little bit of an aside. But the point is that what ends up happening is that. The, the mother ends up so focused on that. The fathers end up on, uh, in our typical society here, they end up working and, uh, and between work and focusing on bringing the stuff in and, uh, and their own interests and all. Uh, what you find is that the parents end up, uh, you know, uh, really there's a divergence there, okay? And, and there's a separation and there's not that intimacy. Okay, and and one of the reasons for that is because of the kids, because you know the parents either are too worried about their work or they're too worried about their kids, and and they don't focus on each other. And this is a great way to come together to discuss, you know, where you're using the the fact that both of you are equally responsible for raising your children, right? Uh, and it's a great way to build that to keep that intimacy going. Okay, where you're spending time talking about the character issues that you see in your in your child, uh, and that's why. You know, uh, I mean, raising children is a is a great uh, and difficult responsibility, and that's why God has ordained for a father and a mother, okay, the two of you, to split the load. Unfortunately, you know, the way that we uh, do things, we end up uh, most of us men, unfortunately, we end up delegating that and saying, "Ah, oh, that's you know, that's the wife's job," okay. So, so Jeffrey, I appreciate that, uh, you know, that your uh, uh, that you are taking responsibility for that. I'll check with Agnes later if that's really true or not, but uh, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I, I'm sure if you are brave enough to say it in public, it's true. Um, but uh, kidding aside, uh, you know, uh, I, I think both have to take responsibility, okay? It's not something to just delegate to the mother to teach. Certainly mothers have a role and they have a, a very important role, but but the fathers should should spend time in this as well and, and work collaboratively with the with the wife, with the mother, you know, in understanding what is the developing needs of the child, right? Spiritually, emotionally, socially, and otherwise. Okay, good. Yeah, any other points, any other questions or uh, those are those are some good dialogue there. I think we'll go ahead and close. Um, 